काशीकर आर्किटेक्ट आदित्य काशीकर कैपिटल प्रोग्राम मैनेजर इंपीरियल कॉलेज लंडन एन एच एस is going to talk about his experience of how nhs you know uh, plans and executes projects aditya is a qualified architect from jj college of architecture along with ms in management and development economics from university of greenwich london along with formal qualifications he is an experienced and certified prince 2 project management professional and member of the association of project management and royal institute of charter surveyors he has been proficient in working with management consultancies for construction matters site redevelopment stakeholder engagement design management and efficient procurement of community health facilities in london he has also been involved with large national health service trusts in england to design manage and deliver capital development programs for acute primary and mental health facilities Aditya was felicitated to by the Queen Elizabeth in 2012 on completion at the inaugural inauguration advanced dementia care unit in Cambridgeshire. He project managed Oak and Beach psychiatric intensive care units. I never knew that there is a intensive care unit in psychiatry, yeah, which was granted the Building Better Healthcare Award in 2009. Aditya currently resides in London. and works with imperial college healthcare nhs as capitals program manager i think aditya should come back to india now it's time yeah so welcome and you know please share your views with us uh, hello all uh, i'm just here to kind of go to go to first thank you vivek and th thank you uh, this uh, yes uh, because we to kind of giving me this sort of chance to be here and sort of give you a sort of a, a scenario of what happens in the national health service in the in the uk and how do services are kind of implemented in a sort of different scenario for the past two days what what we have seen so far is indian healthcare there is 70% uh, is private healthcare whereas 30 to uh, maybe maybe only 25 to 30% is the government healthcare whereas here i'm going to i'm going to speak about the complete opposite whereas a national health service is a government led sort of an, uh, yeah, initiative founded in 1948 possibly giving you medical service for the every taxpayer who is going to be contributing to to the sort of an economy has to be given back free healthcare at a at a point of source and that's the concept of how nhs has been set up therefore the national health service actually survives and kind of occupies at least 85 to 90% of the health services in the U U UK and only 5 to 10% is the private healthcare which is slowly sort of emerging because of the uh, affluent rich who would like to use the private healthcare but it's predominantly the majority of, of the taxpayers are using national health service so that's the that's the sort of premise and that that's how the 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 uh, yeah, presentation will be slightly different in terms of government initiatives how government is emphasizing and how these healthcare programs are run in a sort of a uk sense scenario so please you know excuse me if if things don't kind of tally up or sort of match up but this is how the service uh, provision is so i'm going to just kind of go through the uh, slides and just tell you what what we are trying trying to do in terms of what the service is so the first thing is basically i've just divided the uh, uh, yeah presentation into three parts explaining that I'll, i'll just first give you sort of a brief sort of overview of how the national health service is how the sort of breakdown of the of the acute care services and the primary care services are then talk about the sort of efficiency routes which sort of uh, uh, vivek wants me to kind of briefly uh, uh, touch upon is give you some key lessons or key drivers of the design management and the quality management which is right from the outset of any sort of hospital project what are the government led funding schemes to support this design and how these two kind of marries up uh, together to give you sort of an you know, efficiency in the program program and project uh, yeah, management and then finally just to, uh, touch upon how the nhs improvement is kind of a government led sort of funding sort of body which actually controls all the nhs nhs services and be and be act like a monitor as well as the watchdog to to make sure that the service uh, provision throughout the country is identical that's the, that's the sort of key sort of message here so just want to kind of so do the three three parts which i just explained to you 
Uh, the first thing which I always sort of going to emphasize to for, for sort of pe people is to say health services is like a Rubik cube. A hospital is like a Rubik cube, and you you need these four or five sort of you know dimensions to basically meet, and how those dimensions kind of add up to give you a proper sort of uh, uh, yeah, delivery. One is the breadth, and you should have a required knowledge in the team. You should have the depth of sufficient sort of uh, professional sort of uh, yeah, people. You should have a, a committed staff. You should have you know, accountability and sort of you know, achievement. The, I've shown the accountability in green because we are talk, talking about green uh, health care here. In, in sort of national health service scenario, accountability is a very, very key aspect because if you're not sort of not sort of accountable of the public funds or the public capital reserves which have been given to any sort of hospital trust to build a new, new sort of hospital, then, those, then, the, then the government is kind of liable and sort of, uh, then you're sort of uh, questionable to the government why you're not sort of delivering within the set sort of target. So the accountability is a very key sort of uh, yeah, message. So the, I'm just going to run through quickly in the next two slides is just show you how the NHS services and then just go into the uh, design aspect of it. So, so just going to give you a brief sort of overview. We have the primary service is basically uh, formed of the GPs and the ph uh, pharmacies and the walk-in centers. Uh, the acute trust is about a foundation and general trust. Uh, the ambulance trust, the mental health trust, and the com community health service. So basically, all of these services are are from are, are from like top down. So the primary, secondary, and the tertiary care is all serviced through the government-led sort of uh, funding. So it's basically for the people and by the by the uh, yeah, people, but it is non-profit sort of oriented. So whatever tax funds are coming into are being utilized to give you the health service. Service. So just want to give you a sort of a 2006 view was like this is what kind of how the NHS was kind of divided in terms of these uh, strategic health SHA was kind of formed in terms of how you give the service to, to the primary care trust and, and the uh, secondary care was down below in terms of how the services are give, given across the board and then they go to the NHS trust and the foundation trust. But they are then monitored by the uh, independent uh, regulator who are then monitored. This was slightly changed six years after that in 2012, where they then divided the, the uh, primary function into NHS England and NHS uh, Public Health England. So pub Public Health just looks after the immunization screening and sort of uh, vaccination and all that, whereas NHS England then divides into four different categories, which is, which is primary care, specialized service, offender care, and armed force service, which are then kind of given to the care commissioning group, which are then managed by these three secondary care, community services, mental health, and rehabilitation. So all of these are managed by the by, by, by NHS. And the uh, local trust then goes back to the uh, train, so trust development authority, NHS, Health Watch and sort of monitor, which are then combined, combined together now as NHS, NHS uh, say improvement. So these four categories you see mon monitoring and uh, regulation are being taken as the NHS, uh, NHS improvement. So just moving to the next slide and showing you how I'm going to kind of give you the efficiency lessons which come from the uh, service and the efficiency uh, uh, lessons are based. Basically, I'm going to start speaking about the space planning tools which we use. What are the standardization and how standardization is kind of driving the sort of efficiency within the sort of design management and the construction management phase. How the procurement route is predefined before even you starting on site. The procurement route is already predefined. And what are the contract, contract arrangements which are, which are standardized as per the Royal Institute of uh, British architects. In terms of the architects drive the entire design, design process and design management process, but they obviously are reportable to, to the national health service in terms of how the service is given. Then I'll briefly sort of touch upon two sort of sustainability drivers. One is the BRIAM, which is the building res uh, research establishment uh, energy assessment sort of uh, uh, yeah, method, which is actually coming into place from, from, from 2008. It is exactly same as sort of, as sort of GRIHA, which you have here. GRIHA 5 rating is same as BRIAM excellent or you know, outstanding, outstanding rating. So I'll just go into the further de details in this uh, subsequent slides. The next one is the build, building information modeling, which we have heard so far from, from day one and day, day two yesterday from like Philip as well. Philip was talking about the building information modeling as well. And I'll just briefly uh, touch upon that and give you sort of an example of how it is. 
going back to the Vivek's comment, this is the Harpovery uh, Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit, with, which we just finished, and this is how, how the uh, internal uh, courtyard looks like. It actually gives you larger windows to look inside the landscape to kind of so that the patients are healed in a, in, in a, in a specific way. So the space tools, I'm just going to st start talking about them. Three are the basic space, space tools. One, uh, the first one is the health technical memorandums, which are government-led um, documents. The second one is the health building note. And the third ones are the room, room data sheets or, or the activity uh, database. So the health technical memos are basically predefined, and these are the standard guidebooks or sort of Bible for any sort of an MEP uh, consultants to use from, from the HTM00 to HTM. There are actually, actually there are far, far more numbers up to like, up to like HTM85. So these are being further on in terms of. I've shown the green ones, which, which actually are kind of used by the, by the energy efficiency kind of program and how they're driven. But I've shown the HTM707, uh, purposely in, in, in sort of red color, which is actually the sustainability health is actually a guided document and we have to follow that and you have to comply to this document in terms of building any sort of hospitals. The next one, this is used predominantly by the sort of MEP. So HTMs are used, used by, by, by the sort of MEP team, whereas HBNs are health building notes which are given in 17 different uh, categories or course subjects. And these course subjects give you sort of uh, all the architectural background to it in terms of the space planning, corridor weights, bed, bed spaces, in terms of, and, and those 17 are being divided into all types of care and how those cares are given. Now these documents are based on, on sort of further sort of, uh, yeah, research, at least for far, past 15 years, all the uh, NHS uh, practitioners as well as architects and the team of uh, MEP team have been coming to together to put these documents so that these are the guide, guidance uh, documents on which the overall sort of design is based. So, so these, these are used by the architects. So the next part is once you kind of amalgamate both the HTMs and the HBN, you come to something called as activity database where we kind of have a room data sheet which is actually a kind of a four page document which actually gives you, sorry, which gives you the, the, the page one tells you how the project or the room is, how, what are the activities in that space going to happen, what are, the, what are the planning sort of regulation and how the department floor is going to be. Page two gives you the room environmental data which tells you all about the ME, uh, MEP side of things or right from the fire, fire uh, uh, yeah, regulations to, to kind of uh, building lighting, noise and all that. Page three te tells you about the room character, right, from the finishes to the wall surfaces to the, to the ceiling surfaces. And page four lists just list out all, all the equipment, right, from the fixed furniture to the soft furnishings in the room are listed on one, one sort of page. Now, they are further sort of uh, classified into three different categories as group one, group two, and group three, which perhaps, are, I don't know whether you use that in India, but group one are the items fixed by the contractors, the contractor have to put that in their, in their sort of uh, BOQ when they give you the t uh, tenders back. So group one is, is, is items supplied by the builder. Group two are the items bought by, by the hospital and, and given to the, to the sort of builder to fix it. And group three are the loose furnishing items which, which the hospital have to buy it after, the, after, the, after the hospital is kind of operationally handed, handed back to them. So what happens is all of these three documentation, the HTMs, HPNs, and the room data sheets formulate you to prepare a fully loaded drawing to show you how the rooms are going to be looking like on a sort of a loaded floor plan. And these floor plan, plan, plan with the sort of uh, specifications and the sort of room, room sheets together form the tender package which goes out as a part of the procurement uh, 21 plus pro, uh, procurement plan. I'll just tell you that in a minute in terms of how the, how the framework actually manages and uses that de detail for, for further. So going to the next um, efficiency thing is the standardization. The second thing which, which, which they predominantly use is standardization in terms of the, 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 the procurement 21 framework is basically a cost reduction program implemented by the gov government to implement that you use standardized products for everything you do, right from the medical gas pipelines to the light fixtures to the uh, floor, floor finishes. Everything is standardized so that you then have a sort of a standard, standard floor finishes to use for any sort of makeup or any sort of area. So you have those guidance documents. Now, 
Uh, standardization actually helps you to kind of reduce the consultation time with all the stakeholders because you have to then, then just follow and tell them this is how the con consultation. It actually reduces the risk in terms of like, I'll give you a very classic sort of example over here is like if you're not using an anti-slip floor for any of the uh, dementia or sort of, an, or, or sort of uh, uh, elderly care ward, then you're, you're not really kind of complying because if you don't have an anti-slip floor in a sort of elderly, elderly care ward, then, then there's a more, more risk in terms of the, of the patient not kind of being saved there and therefore the patient is not getting well sort of any so sooner. So these are kind of practical things you know, attached to how, how standardization actually impacts you. So the second, the next two parts is about patient safety. Uh, I'll just give you a very good uh, uh, okay, view on this as well. There are, we, have, we have managed to give at least 22 to 23 different light, light fittings across the sort of NHS now. And those light fittings are specified and standardized so that you use similar type or make or model of the, of the, of the, of the light fitting for, for the reception area for the uh, waiting lobbies to the uh, consultant. So basically, because you have standard supplies on the NHS uh, supply chain, we just use those products so that there, there is no kind of, you know, uh, duplication of, of the, any cost to kind of do any work. So basically, standardization is kind of the way that design services are managed. Similarly, you also kind of standardize in terms of the AHU make and model, the pipe work to use for for, for medical gases, for the bed trunking, to use the Drago, Drago or Philips patient uh, monitoring system, to use Siemens or, or sort of GE uh, uh, equipment, all has been standardized so that you can, you can then buy them through the NHS portal, uh, uh, supply chain portal, so you can then process it in a, in a standardized way. So you, are, you know what you're buying, which is already kind of pre sort of uh, wetted and checked, so you, are, you know exactly what, what you're going to get as a sort of end product on, on the site. The next one is about the, about the efficiency, which, which we have been talking for the past, past, past two days at this uh, summit. The efficiency and the pro, uh, procurement, if you see the health uh, expenditure until 2021, we are looking at around 22 billion pounds in terms of efficiency savings, which, which the government is kind of uh, emphasizing on. And therefore, they have introduced two or may, maybe more kind of construction frameworks to use them. The first is the Procure 21 Plus, which I was talking about, is now being changed from this year onwards, becoming as Procure 22. It's a government-led construction procurement framework, which actually helps you to deliver capital programs. And those are kind of what happens in the, is like the day of, you have, you have the consistency of, of four primary supply chain partners, and they will then kind of act as a sort of a, a catalyst to kind of deliver the pro, uh, program through. So I'll just, I'll just kind of give you a, Explanation, what happens in a, in a sort of a primary supply chain partner will sort of employ an architect, m &E, structural, BMS, uh, Condi serv surveyors, and the, all these various sort of team, as well as work with all the BIM team at the same time. And they will be the, the, the link between the client, NHS, and the primary supply chain partner will only report to them. So the architects and the team will report to the primary supply chain partner, not to the client. Therefore, that reduces the risk of terms of the uh, design sort of conflict and all that. So what, whatever is conveyed is already as per the ga guidance notes. So you, there is no kind of uh, disputes kind of happening in terms of how you manage the program. So this, this framework is, uh, is kind of based on there are five or six nationally uh, accredited primary su uh, uh, supply chain partners. And those partners will use and keep on keep on keep on sort of using them. What happens by them is you're keeping the team, you know, effectively the same team repeats and you kind of work with the same sort of uh, design mindset. So basically you kind of do the knowledge, knowledge sort of, uh, transfer from one to the other and, and you kind of manage how you kind of, ma maybe from the lessons learned from the previous uh, project, you use it for the next one. And that's how the Procure 22 scheme actually is kind of much more uh, feasible and sort of much more sort of usable in a way. The second way of looking at things is, is the traditional con uh, construction because the Procure 22 scheme is only, only applicable if the total capital value is more than 3 million pounds, which is approximately around uh, 25, 25 crores Indian ru uh, okay, rupees. Or we then kind of go for the traditional con uh, construction program whereby it has been, the, the contract is prearranged, whether we use a, a joint court a tribunal contract or a national engineering contract, and how do you use that con contract going forward. In a, sort of, in a sort of traditional way, the 
hospital is fully designed, fully specified, tendered, and you then go into the con uh, uh, construction phase only and only if once, once you got the final ten uh, tender price. There is no scope for any changes. Whatever changes you want to make, you have to make the changes before, the, before you go live on site. Okay? Therefore, that's the reason BIM is very sort of a uh, uh, crucial point where I'll come, uh, come to that in why, why BIM is sort of important in both the sort of frameworks. The next is about the energy, energy efficiency and sort of uh, procurement funding options which the government is kind of leading into. The two things with which I'm going to just emphasize here is there is an energy, 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 uh, energy efficiency fund being give, given right from 2015-16 until the years to come uh, is about 49 million GBP is kind of you know, given by the government around 420 crore, crore sort of rupees to kind of develop and use the project only for en uh, okay, sustainable uh, ways of making. Out of those, 22 of these pro uh, okay, projects are for lighting sort of upgrade of all the, all the hospitals throughout sites. It's more like a retrofit uh, okay, project, but they, they are, these are all government-led uh, yeah, initiatives. The second one is the Salix Fund, which is actually a kind of a capital fund given by the government to only for the public, public sector, including uh, in, including NHS in terms of giving out at least 33 uh, million pounds, 282 uh, crore sort of, uh, rupees, which are totaling to at least 58,000 carbon uh, reduction in terms of how you do it. Now, if you see in both the, in both the sort of uh, funding scheme, the predominant one is the combined heat and power plant, which, which, which obviously may not be, um, may not be applicable in the Indian context because, because, of the, because, because the entire Europe is, is kind of a cold region. We have sort of a heating systems as well as the cooling systems inbuilt in, in, into the uh, planning. Therefore, using a combined heat and, uh, heat and uh, power plant emphasizes and sort of you know, uh, reduces the heating as well as the power sort of bills and, and how you kind of manage it. So if you see the, both, the, both the sort of pie charts, if you see 40% of the funds are basically invested in the combined heat pa plant so that it is kind of giving you sort of larger sort of efficiencies. So if you see other than the capital reserves by, by the NHS, there are almost like 420 plus 280, at least you're looking at 700 crore rupees is invested by the government in sort of an addition to the already sort of committed money to, 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 to be kind of invested. So it's, it shows the government sort of... Uh, Willingness to co contribute on how you do do it. Okay. So the next part, which I want just want to touch upon, is about the sustainability uh, ways and means how we do it. The it is BRIAM is basically a building research uh, establishment. is actually a BRE BRE Global is kind of an organization which actually kind of promotes sustainability so ways and means to kind of use, and they are applicable to the healthcare buildings too. So BRIAM is same like Griha in, in, in sort of India, and those are the cat categories and the, and the weightage which, which is given to the aspect, and those are the rating and the score. So if we see Gri Griha 5 is actually 90, which is, which is, which is, which is actually BRIAM outstanding, is, is, is actually 85. So at that point, I'm just going to kind of show you how the, how the assessment happens right at the, at the design stage of the pre uh, uh, yeah. Construction stage at the actual stage, and then you get the BRIAM uh, certification. I've seen that the GRIHA rating is is applicable for five years or for three years. I'm not sure on that, but BRIAM is applicable for five years in terms of excellence, and then obviously they'll kind of review it as you as you kind of go ahead. At that point, I just want to show you a video in terms of how this uh, uh, rating happens. So video one, please. These are, number one, BREAM delivers sustainable solutions. Number two, it provides a framework to get the balance right. Number three, it is based on sound science. Number four, it supports a process of change. And number five, 
ultimately delivers value to the occupants of the building. The first principle is that Bream delivers sustainable solutions. When many people hear the word sustainability, they think of the environment. But a sustainable solution is simply one that works now and for a long time in the future, and is a solution that works in every respect, not just environmentally. The triple bottom line of sustainability includes social, economic and environmental impacts, and a successful development will address all three. In Bream, environmental sustainability also covers a wide spectrum and is not just about saving energy. Environmental categories include areas such as pollution, ecology, materials, waste, water and transport. Bream encourages developments that align with economic needs on a wider community level and supports cost-effective solutions by encouraging long-term thinking over the full life cycle of the buildings, not just the construction. Its process also creates a framework for a considered approach, leading to increased efficiency and collaboration. And Bream rewards buildings that best serve the occupants, keeping them healthy and providing the services and facilities required in and around the building. From keeping people thermally comfortable to providing easy access to transportation, Bream buildings allow occupants to flourish. So the second principle is that Bream provides a new model or framework, one that includes key factors for a sustainable world within it and will help to steer away from major problems towards solutions that work longer term. Bream does this by creating a weighted, balanced scorecard which addresses a broad range of concerns of sustainability in buildings to help shift away from the unsustainable business-as-usual models. The third principle is that Bream is based on sound science, the latest scientific and building research. Bream has access to a broad range of industry and scientific experts and has extensive consultations in evolving new versions of Bream schemes. These include official technical steering groups and a standing panel of experts. The Bream Core Technical Standard is at the heart of our code for a sustainable built environment. Principle four is that Bream supports a process of change by recognising and rewarding best practice that go beyond building regulations and issue certificates as proof of compliance. It provides a framework for governments and organisations to set direction, lead and reward progress, leading to real change as well as increased reputation and marketability for those organisations. It also provides a framework for creating rapid change and innovation. Feedback is needed on every level, and the BREAM process can provide this and support best practice in developers, contractors, architects, builders, and most importantly, occupiers, via post-occupancy feedback. Our increasingly standardised key performance indicators, or KPIs, support monitoring and tracking of relative performance in buildings, leading to accelerated change. And finally, Bream ultimately aims to deliver real and demonstrable value to the occupants or owners of the building. A building that works, that meets the needs of the occupants or owners, helps them flourish, is cost effective over the life of the building and that operates within the limits of the Earth's finite resources. Whether a new building being created or the continued development or running of an existing building, Bream can help individuals and businesses manage the risk associated with their buildings, increase sales or lettings value, increase levels of corporate social responsibility, and better environments for employees, all contribute to long-term value. Bream schemes all reward reduced consumption of resources, cost efficiency, and the creation of a healthy, productive internal environment. Individual criteria stretch from energy efficiency service life planning and costing, transportation links and waste processes to stakeholder participation, good daylighting, air quality, thermal comfort and acoustics. This is why we believe that these five principles mean that Bream can help deliver real and sustainable value in the built environment. Okay, so just to go to the Next slide is I'm going to just show you the example use of Bream in a hospital, which is which has been called, awarded as Bream excellent rating of 74.6 percent is in NHS uh, Dumfries and Galloway 
in Scotland. I do have a video to show for this, but I'll show it towards the end if I have time. So this, this is this is the 85 bedded sort of inpatient acute mental health unit, which which I've been sort of part, partly work, working through, and and the sort of the, the, the five sort of environmental pa parts which we are given through is the district you know energy uh, system is fueled by the sort of biomass and heating the domestic water, water pipes which is the heat exchanger system. The entire structure is prefabricated modular structure so that there is no construction waste on site. There are uh, unique sort of anti-pligature windows, and that's why we, we were talking about St. St. Gobi and glass here yesterday, which gives you a natural, 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 natural ventilation at the same time. There is high level of daylighting with views outside to, to the sort of landscape, and there are low water sort of appliances used so that you have sub, sub sort of uh, metering, as, as we spoke in uh, Schneider's uh, talk on day one at the summit. So this is just a brief example for the healthcare. The next part is about the this is how, how the hospital looks like from inside. Obviously, this is a mental health unit, so there are quite sort of high-level windows in how they kind of portray to. The next one, which, which we have been sort of hearing this for the past two days at this, at this summit, is the building information modeling uh, system, which is like a digital platform prepared before you kind of go into the final end result. So basically, it's a digital platform which gives you, once you basically kind of design the building twice, or once you build it, to show to, the, show to the occupiers and the users, and then you build it actually in terms of physical feasibility. There's a BIM task group being sort of set up since 2015, and how the task group kind of you know, initiate changes and gives you the life cycle uh, costing and sort of improves the energy uh, uh, yeah, performance. So BIM is used in a, in a sort of a, a healthcare environment, which is the, I'll, I'll show, just show an example of Shrewsbury and Tel, Telford NHS Trust, where they've used for a 135 bedded sort of women and children hospital which has been again used as a procured 21, 21 project. Now this is a two-story sort of uh, refurbishment of an already existing uh, uh, two-story building. So there's actually a, a four-story sort of building in total to give you more 100, 100, 135 beds. So we were kind of achieving the sign-off at the same time. We were having the integrated beam made base, but all these are MNE uh, uh, equipment actually helps to kind of feel the space and do, do a sort of digital walkthrough before you kind of come to the final sort of end result of actually building it, building it right. Obviously, there was a comprehensive design uh, coordination workshops made to, to avoid any sort of duplicate cost or any sort of ongoing cost afterwards. So the BIM benefits, which, which we've already sort of heard about for the past two days, is that, 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 that these visualizations give you a kind of a functional view in terms of how it, it looks and actually gives you sort of reduce the redesigning sort of program. Once you kind of put it on BIM, you're already there and you, you, you exactly know how the service, service clashes are going to be there and how the service clashes can be sort of avoided. The next one is BIM, BIM actually kind of, kind of uh, dovetails or basically adds up to adding standardized, standardized components and how we kind of use a repeatable design output. I don't know whether you all sort of noticed there, there's a, something very good which, which, which is our NHS Trust are working right now is they have made a repeatable use app. So if you're using a repeated room, for example, a bed bay or a sort of a consulting room, we have that app and the app will tell you what you need in the room. Rather than kind of redesigning the same thing again, it's just the app tells you and you just kind of multiply, uh, multiply that and that, that gives you much more sort of efficiency and saves time in terms of design input. And secondly, the BIM actually kind of gives you energy, sort of, yeah, energy analysis and give, it's very kind of inspiring, reassuring, and, and actually gives you patient-centered sort of uh, centered and safer kind of or spaces which, which you can create. The last one which I just want to pick up about is NHS improvement, which I was talk, talking about. The NHS improvement is actually a kind of a combined body which has been now set up since 2016, which actually manages the trust, trust development authority, the, um, the learning system, and the sort of, you know, uh, trust sort of uh, monitor, which brings it all together so that we can ma manage the improvement and kind of positive changes, how we, how we kind of get along. I'll just show you a quick video of, of how NHS improvement actually uses, uses in the sort of efficiency savings, and we can go through that. Video two, please. The NHS really matters to all of us. It's there for every one of us when we need it, and for 1.4 million of us, making the National Health Service happen is our job. Right now, the NHS is under a lot of pressure. We're asking more each year from health services as the population grows and changes. But public funding for the NHS isn't growing so fast. A lot of NHS trusts and foundation trusts are facing big challenges. 
Their task is to meet the nation's health needs within the NHS budget. But how can they extend services and maintain or improve the quality of what they do at the same time as keeping a lid on costs? Part of the answer is to work together with local communities and with other NHS and social care organisations in remodelling local healthcare systems. With everyone's input, the systems can be designed to deliver high quality, affordable care indefinitely. But none of this is easy. NHS Improvement works alongside NHS Trusts and Foundation Trusts to help them overcome these difficult challenges. Our job is to support Trusts in their efforts to improve their care quality, operational efficiency and financial management. We also hold Trusts to account for meeting national standards in all these areas. If Trusts can't meet these standards, we intervene in line with our statutory duty to protect and promote the interests of people who use healthcare services. As the sector regulator, we also set the rules determining the tariff for NHS services and make sure procurement, choice and competition operate in patients' best interests. We help trusts to help themselves in three main ways. First, we provide their board members and managers with more of the skills, systems and information they need to prevent preempt and tackle their particular issues and to continuously improve. Second, we give trust practical, evidence-based help. We can advise on how to make services more efficient without eroding quality, for instance by managing waiting lists differently. We can suggest how to improve clinical quality without overspending, but we avoid duplicating effort. Our first instinct is to check the expertise that's out there and link people together. So we're a hub for sharing existing good practice and knowledge across the sector. Third, we spell out what success looks like for trusts, so everyone knows what they're aiming for and how to measure progress. For our part, we work with our national partners at the centre of the health system, like NHS England and the Care Quality Commission, to make sure we all speak with one voice to the sector and that our individual messages and actions are consistent. And at NHS Improvement, we're committed to continuously improving ourselves. We refine our support in line with what works best for trusts. NHS Improvement is an incredibly exciting organisation to be part of. Helping NHS trusts and foundation trusts do their job is a really important job to do. Our support makes a real difference to them and their patients, to all of us. Thanks. So that's how the NHS improvement works. And the final bit is what I want to just show you the, how the change model works in the NHS improvement. It basically, if you have a clear purpose to kind of do the change changes further along, and that's how we have a clear purpose and a shared purpose in terms of how, the, how this matrix works out. There's actually kind of innovation right at the core in terms of what, what we do. The program, pr program, pr program delivery is having strict Gantt charts and key milestones to kind of achieve. There's a meaningful sort of, uh, Okay, measurement how, how tasks and how gateway sign off we take for everything we do in NHS. At the same time, yesterday, Philips was kind of uh, saying on, on, on the stakeholder uh, engagement right from the outset, and stakeholders have to be made as owners, and they, they need to be given sort of ownership that if you do this, this is what the improvement will look like, and therefore you need to kind of demonstrate. I'm just going to leave you with, with one last thing to kind of show you, is Schneider didn't sort of pick this up on day one, but Schneider has done a very good uh, efficiency project in sort of uh, UK at the Somerset NHS uh, Foundation Trust, where they have uh, achieved, and the 250-bedded uh, acute district, uh, district hospital, they have managed to give savings for the next 10 years of 17 million pounds, which is actually 144 44 crores, looking in terms of giving the savings of, of energy of, uh, uh, efficiency. I've spoken, uh, I spoke to Alok re regarding this, and asked. He has asked me to show you this. This is what Schneider has done in UK too to kind of improve. And Schneider wants to do a similar thing in, in India now. And the last thing I'm just going to show you the model of the building con uh, construction of how it is fast track and how it is com compliant and how sustainable. And therefore, the Galloway and sort of uh, Dumfries uh, NHS trusts have used modular buildings to use the trust. Okay. Before I go to the questions part of it, I would just want to ask the, you to show you the last final video where we have used robotics to kind of serve food to patient beds 
and to manage the portering system in, in a sort of hospital in Scotland. So just want to show you that and then we can jump into questions. We have only one minute to show that video, the ro ro robotic video, please. And you'll be, yeah. this is the same what, what the doctor. Is very impressive. It is on track to be open No, no, the next the one, the next one. Well, the hospital is very impressed. Not, not the next one. Yeah, that's the one. Becky, now here's a glimpse of the future for you. Computer software developed in Yorkshire is driving the first fleet of robots to be used in a British hospital. The robots will free up support staff and help reduce infection risks. Final tests are underway before the hospital opens next month. With the story, here's our health correspondent, Penny Buster. Robots are being put through their paces as part of last-minute checks before the imminent opening of a £300 million hospital in Scotland. Their performance, meanwhile, is being monitored 200 miles away in Wakefield. The software developed here keeps a big brother eye on them. We're hooked into the robots. We know what they should be doing, when they should be doing it. And on a red and a green chart, we're automatically flagging up if things have gone wrong. The same system will be used on handheld devices at the hospital to automatically dispatch porters and take food orders at the bedside. The firm's performance management system is already used in the Manchester tram network. The Scottish hospital is their first health project, but their fame is spreading. But we were looking forward to doing a lot more in health and similar opportunities like this. So we've already branched out overseas. It's in Chinese in the People's Hospital in Beijing. It's beginning to use our software this week as well. The Scottish robots will operate out of sight in specially designed tunnels and lifts. With dirty linen removed by one and fresh delivered by another, it's expected infection risks should be reduced. Penny Weston, BBC Rock North, Wakefield. Okay, some sport now. So. So if you have any questions, please do. So, so you can see that basically being, being green is not that easy, but it, it has to be made easy if you have at least some sort of standardization in place and have the, uh, have the right sort of uh, willingness to kind of do the healthcare projects. So any questions on, on, the, on the floor? Thank you, Aditya, for a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, you said your designs do not go on the floors, uh, you know, till the design is completed in all respects. So could you share what's the typical design cycle like? Uh, as in you want to know the time, time, time frame. So the once the design is on the drawing board, we're looking at at least four months to complete the design. Design that would month. typically be for a... 16 uh, weeks. But that yeah. would be for a size of what... So size of around maybe 150 bedded ho hospital at least four months timeline because we have to kind of preset the time before you kind of have a design management uh, team. From, from concept to good for construction drawings in four weeks plan? Uh, four not plan? from concept, from, from, from the initial. So basically how the, and I, I didn't explain the finances aspect of it. I just concentrated only on the, on the architectural part and how the design uh, implementation. The finances are, are sort of simultaneously happening in sort of in sync with the de design process. So the outline, out, outline business case is basically you just do the, do the schematic layouts, get the per square feet or per square meterage values, you know, insert them on a standard sort of outline uh, uh, business case uh, form, and the finance will kind of approve that, that, that sort of sum for you to go to the full business case. The full business case is actually fully designed, fully tendered price inserted in the, in the sort of uh, yeah, business case because the NHS trust has to then go to the N NHSI, NHS, uh, improvement to ask for more money. So that's the full business case. So the timeline between the outline business case, schematic drawings, or the pre-sign-off pre drawings to the full design is 16 weeks, roughly. We are, we are actually allowed for 16 weeks. All right, thanks. I think uh, this is a very interesting process where you know, the Indian, Indian government has to look into. Where, as you were rightfully saying, that majority of hospital uh, infrastructure is being developed by, in India, by private sector. 
and the government sector is just sleeping. So, in fact, it should be the other way here, where you have more of the government sector who sort of uh, uh, gets into the act of using this process as a module and working on it, so that it will be affordable and economic for people to, you know, follow through. That is one. And the, and the other aspect is these processes to keep on upgrading uh, new technology. There were so much amount of technology-driven exercises which were talked about yeah. uh, yesterday and day before yesterday. So N NHS frequently updates this sort of uh, technological uh, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Into your system. They they do. They have a regular cycle of uh, updating the uh, health uh, HTMs and and how the HTMs are used. But then what what happens if you if you only introduce a new technology, say for example, you have a new uh, pneumatic tube uh, supplier, and if you use it in the ho hospital, then you kind of do something on the sort of design uh, so uh, sign-off sheet. We do something like a, a, a derogation sheet at the same time. So the derogation is like we are not complying fully with the HTM, but we are derogating with the sort of uh, proviso that the government will introduce this as a, as a next change in the next sort of you know, iteration of the, of, the, of the document. So that derogation is documented so that the government is aware that this, this, this NHS trust is going to do this on the sort of, uh, yeah, proviso that we, we will sort of implement that, that in the, implement that as a new sort of process change. We do, we do that all the time. Okay. Regarding the standardization and uh, so many aspects related to planning, you have uh, some sort of a standard flow of planning processes you, you tend to, you know, work with. You know, uh, when you're talking about layout planning and so many things, everything is standardized. Is this available as a document in the website where anyone can... If you go as an... Uh, I didn't show it on this other... If you go on the uh, uh, Department of Health uh, okay, website, dh.gov.uk, and just sort of go and search over there, you can search the health technical... Uh, uh, the memorandums for the architects to just understand how exactly this process so if you download their summary document which which, which is i think the htm 00 and, and it's like hbn1 or hbn01 i think you, you can you can get the full summary but obviously I, I i'm not sure whether you can download all the further documents in india you may have to download from in um, uk you can download them that's that's where you go Okay, so uh, it was a really good lecture from you. Uh, I just want to ask that I was, you know, looking at that dream, what you just explained to us. So uh, there are different categories, uh, you know, weighted for, uh, um, you know, uh, differently for this uh, certification or whatever it is. So I was just, uh, I just want to ask as an architect that, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is your stand uh, uh, for construction techniques? There is no point for construction techniques. Do we, do, do we really need construction techniques to be included in? A green building. Uh, if you see that the, 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 there's not a construction uh, technique point, but, but there, is, there is a point actually for, for categorizing of, of the of, of, of you know of towards the end towards the uh, it, towards the last one is is about the innovation. Okay. I mean, shall I just go back on, on the presentation? You can, can go back and see the presentation. Where, where can I go back to the presentation? So the, there are at least ten percent of, of the score is for the uh, innovation and in that you can use the construction techniques in that. I know. So, so if you see uh, yeah, materials and, and management, where there, there is a score we, which you can take from there. Okay. I know uh, energy efficiency or also construction techniques is, is not kind of fully visible, but you, you have to kind of further sort of uh, expand them and, and explain to the BRIAMs or Okay, assessment team, and they will give you scoring for those. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, Aditya, your uh, BRIAM model and GRIHA model are quite similar. What I have seen yeah. so far. Uh, uh, what I want to ask is, what's the model for India that you are proposing? What is the business model? What are you proposing to do in India? Uh, uh, proposing in terms of the government policy in cha terms changes. Two government. Yeah. I can't singularly do that. It has to be a bottom-up or a top-down top kind of approach. But the thing is, BRIAM or, or something similar like BRIAM can be can easily introduce along with GRIHA because BRIAM concentrates majority on the public sector buildings. Like education, healthcare, social care buildings are all taken under BRIAM. So 
if you want to then have a sort of amalgamation of all both both the sort of uh, team and you know, introduce as a government po okay, policy, you can sort of do it that way. Uh, so, in your proposal, Briam is a bit better than Griha. It is in a way because Bri Briam give, gives you further sort of uh, efficiency savings at times. Gri Griha is best. I've, go I've gone through the Griha documentation. Griha is actually kind, of, but Griha is more applicable to to the to the residential or sort of the commercial market. I think no, Griha, Griha, Griha is no. not really kind of. Is it very healthcare focused? It is focused. Maybe I'm I'm wrong then. So that's what the question. I'll talk to you later about that. Thanks. Yeah. Any further questions? No, I think we're running out of time. So you know, uh, the next speaker has a flight to catch. Uh, thank you so much. You know, Aditya. I think you know a lot to learn from NHS. And uh, something that you didn't show was how do you you know have the data room sheet? You know, room data sheet or whatever you call that. So. If, if you could share, you know, later on with someone, you know, yeah, on, on okay, my okay, okay. Because that's something that we don't do. So if you start doing it, you know, properly, we won't miss out things, you know, but which generally happens. Uh, can I just call upon my colleague Samir Mehta here to felicitate Aditya? So I picked upon him because he is very methodical and very standardized. <laughs> no, in his thinking process.